Hello and welcome to a special edition of the Africa Daily Show. As you can see, it's kind of like not the usual routine setting. We're seated in the gardens of Africa Global Radio, where we normally bring you the show live from our base at Accra, Ghana. I am Barry Musa, and uh, it's uh, going to be a very interesting conversation, insightful, I must say, and uh, very interactive. And uh, it is dubbed time with uh, Professor Yidana on surviving Africa in the 21st century. Echoes and lessons uh, from the 20th century. And this is uh, against the background of this particular book that is Surviving Africa in the 21st Century. Echoes and lessons from the 20th, 20th century that he's yet to launch. And there are key areas that he, uh, you know, seeks to look at in this particular book. And these are the areas that we're going to be talking about. It's going to be six uh, sessions. And by that, we will be uh, wrapping uh, every session to enable you have more in-depth you know, understanding of the conversation that we will be having. And these videos, uh, the, the, the conversations, the questions, I mean, what they, 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 they reveal to us, and things that we might not be in the known, would be made available on our YouTube videos, Africa Global Radio. All you need to do is subscribe, like, and share. So it's going to be a one-hour, 30-minute session. And like I said, after each uh, session, we would wrap it up and move on to the next one. So in our midst, I have uh, Professor Yidana of uh, Grand Valley State University. Areas of specialty include historical sociology, political economy, in development and culture. And he's currently working on a book, the book I just mentioned, Surviving Africa in the 21st Century, Echoes and Lessons from the 20th Century. Very interesting uh, title right there. And of course, we have in our midst as well a, a, a guest uh, a speaker who is Dr. Mankutam Tracy Keith Fleming, formerly um, Associate Professor of Area and Global Studies at Grand Valley University, uh, Grand Valley Grand Valley State University, University uh, Michigan in the USA. Uh, now lectures at the University of Environment and Sustainable Development, Somenia, here uh, in Ghana, in the Department of General Studies in the School of Natural and Environmental Sciences. Now he is also uh, the author of Travel and the Pan-African Imagination, another I mean, intriguing uh, book that you might want to go look out and uh, find out more about it. Hello, Professor, and hello, Doctor. I mean, it's great having you uh, on the special edition of the African edition. This is where we normally have our, you know, where the think tank goes on, mm -hmm. you know, when we really want to take it off the studio and trying to get into serious matters. But it's great to have you, uh, do, uh, Professor. Thank you for having me. Super. Well. Super. Yeah. And Doctor, uh, thank you for joining us as well. It is an honor. Thank you. Great. I mean, this is my second time interacting with you. Yes. The first time we had a conversation was, uh, on the phone. you know, exactly on yeah. the phone and uh, around the U.S. elections and what have you. Yes. Uh, what the turnout might be and everything. Has, yes. anything, has anything changed so far or is it just the same thing? I was hoping you say that most of my predictions came true. Uh, absolutely. That was what I was... <laughs> <laughs> okay, right, right, right. Yeah. All right, so we get straight to our conversation. Uh, just to uh, recount on what I mentioned earlier, it's going to be in six parts. And after each part, we wrap it up and then we get to the next uh, conversation. Interesting topics here that we will be covering. So we, we're having moral and ethical decay, wealth and misuse of resources, the centrality of Nigeria uh, to West Africa, the role of pandemics, as well as uh, China and India in sub-Saharan Africa, and finally, environment. Very interesting uh, topics right there. But let's begin with the first conversation. I'll be, I'll be starting with uh, Prof. Sayidana on moral and ethical decay. Now, here's the case. I mean, every now and then, when you speak to our elderly in our societies and our various homes, you know, they, they mention certain bits that we feel, ah, they speak too much. Why are you talking too much? They tell you the certain proverbs go like, uh, what an, old, an elderly man can see seated, the young one cannot see standing. So, I mean, what, what, is, what aspects of uh, moral and ethical decay uh, are you looking to, to, to let us see that we're not seeing? Or why is it so important for you to actually bring it or factor it in your upcoming literature, Prof? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me start by saying that my main audience for the book right. is not the intellectual world. Right. Quite frankly, uh, the intellectual world has failed the world generally mm -hmm. because um, in particular Africa, um, 
what we produce as intellectuals is inaccessible to a majority of the people that actually need to know the kinds of things that we're talking about. So my main audience is what I call the critical masses, both in volume and importance, okay. right? Now, in terms of the moral decay and collapse, I'm looking specifically as the morals and ethics of the governing elite. Mm. Not so much the ordinary men and women on the street. Um, what we have, uh, some call it corruption, uh, people give it different names. <coughs> but morals is about an individual's, if you ask philosophers, they'll tell you, it's about an individual's sense of right and wrong. Right. Ethics is about the society's, the general society's sense of what is right uh -huh. and what is wrong. Exactly. My contention is that the fundamental crisis that Africa faces mm -hmm. moving forward is that of the ethical and moral decay of the governing elite. Right. That's, the, that's, the main, mm. that's the main point. Right. And what do I mean by that? I mean by that the sort of antipathy, meaning um, uh, lack of a deep sense of empathy mm. for what other human beings mm. are going through. Right. So in a sense, that my other audience is what I call the general human, okay. right? That is the human who is on the street uh -huh. uh, hawking, uh -huh. the human who works very hard, uh -huh. the human who has to contend with the ungovernable traffic uh, um, and you leave home at 4 a.m. in the morning, come back, your children are asleep, you don't even get to see them, they are going to school. Uh -huh. So basically, those are the things that I refer to as the moral and ethical decay. Right. It's essentially that of our mm. governing mm. Uh, elite. Right, and, and, yeah. and, and by so, are you, are you implying that they have actually veered off the path that, or the role they're supposed to be playing? I am implying mm. there's an ancient African philosopher right. who said that a society mm -hmm. that wishes mm. to find its footing okay. in every which way must be aware not to give power mm -hmm. to men and women who think from the stomach down. Wow. They must give power to men and women who think from the chest up. I am implying that our political and economic elite in Africa uh. tend to think from the stomach down. Right. And when you think from the stomach down, uh. you're dealing with greed, uh -huh. you're dealing with um, the absence of empathy and concern. Lack of humanity. Lack of humanity. Right. And, and so part of the collapse uh. is you're beginning to see what I call the fragile dignity of humanity. Mm. And by that, humanity itself is disappearing. Because right. what does it mean to be a human being? Mm. We haven't resolved that question. We have not debated that question. Not even philosophy has not debated that question. They've assumed mm. what they, they assumed biological right. humanity. Mm. But, but our being words a history, mm. it words a culture, exactly. it words all these things. That was the other costume mm. that shape our biological existences, right? Mm. So biology merely proposes, but it is history, society, and politics that disposes. Mm -hmm. And that's the point. Right. Yes. Very interesting submissions right there made by Prof. And I must say, your, your speaking, you know, the voices or the words of the average you know, man walking on the streets, because when you go out there right now, you ask them, what is the condition? What, what state are you in? I think one of the things they would mention is we are suffering, yes. you know, we, we, we are not seeing results. We are not seeing promises being fulfilled by government yes. and everything. So clearly, uh, Doc has, uh, Professor has really, really, you know, done his research and, and he clearly understands. I mean, for one who resides and teaches in the university in the U.S., this is a clear, he's speaking the language of the average man, the, the citizen here, that is supposed to be, on a normal circumstance, getting a fair share of the national cake, unfortunately, they actually suffer the consequence. Because at the end of the day, when we head to the polls, these are the same people that grant you the power to go make things right. Unfortunately, it doesn't really go that way. Uh, I'll switch to uh, Prof uh, Dr. Uh, Mankutam on this same um, topic. Um, Pro Prof has made some uh, very important, uh, you, know, con uh, you know, has established the whole conversation surrounding how the average individual, the average Ghanaian, those that are not in, that are that are not privileged to be in place of power, being the ones suffering uh, the results of, uh, you know, our leaders up there. Oh, thank you very much. Okay. I think the diagnosis of the 
a crisis of moral and ethics in our society uh, is quite accurate. Mm. So I, I will only add um, my thoughts in regard to uh, possibilities of problem solving. Right. And one of the ways, I, one of the critical dimensions um, that is missing from dominant narratives um, regarding problem solving is a focus on a truly African-centered perspective. Mm. So as a person who has fashioned himself into being an Africologist or a okay. person who takes an Afrocentric approach to African phenomena okay. uh, anywhere in the world, mm. I think it is critical that we begin to put ourselves in conversations, as Professor Yudana suggested, right. with uh, African principles uh -huh. and his invocation of a classical African uh, philosophical tradition uh, points us certainly in the right direction. Uh. Um, I think there is a lacuna okay. of appreciation of our cultural heritage. Okay. There's one political scientist by the name of Ajay uh, Ora. Okay. He wrote a very important small book uh, that was not written. He's a PhD in political science. He wrote a very important small book called Afrophobia, okay. The Fear of Being an African. And right. he talked about the deleterious effects mm. or impact of domination or colonialism upon African people on the continent mm. as well as in the African world community. And um, it's in the same spirit of speaking to individuals inside and outside of academia. Mm. Um, and I think such efforts are effective tools to engage in um, problem solving. Right. Right. Okay. Uh, 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 Dr. Mankutam uh, uh, has actually, you know, moved further to looking at not just about what is happening, but how we can do, uh, you know, in terms of problem solving and everything. But prob uh, Dr. Do you think our leaders are in tune in that direction where we all know we have a problem? Are they a problem solving leaders? I think our leaders are certainly aware of the necessity of engaging in problem solving on a consistent basis. Mm. Um, we also have to take into account the global constraints that they operate within. Okay. Uh, and when I, by global constraints, I speak of the socioeconomic climate mm. that we live in, in which the air unfair uh, terms of or terms of trade or okay. economic uh, relationships on in the global theater right. dictate uh, most, if not all, of their actions. Um, for instance, I was reading recently in the newspaper regarding the World Health Organization's condemnation of Western nations' right. uh, decision to administer the booster jabs exactly, when yeah, millions yeah. of people in the world mm. uh, are the most vulnerable at this point when it mm. comes to immunization exactly. efforts uh, and other public health matters. Mm. Um, but one has to ask the question, well, what do our leaders do in such a context? Exactly. Right? So they, they are operating within power systems or mm. grids in which um, their decisions are necessarily um, in conversation with those dynamics. Okay. All uh, right. May I, let me add <coughs> something to that. Mm. But I, I, you see, <coughs> uh, Professor Fleming mm. makes a point mm. that has this sort of um, um, uh, um, tension within it, right? Okay. Because if you're locked in a room mm. of uh, five meters, six meters, seven meters, whatever, right? and you have to exercise, mm. you've got to get creative within that constriction. Yeah, you can't do the same thing over again. Exactly. Right. So, so, of course, there are global systemic strictures mm -hmm. that makes it fundamentally difficult to function mm -hmm. uh, but as he lays the question out mm. what is the creative leadership right you know what i call what are we doing differently exactly mm. i i call that kind of breed of leadership mm. polylectors these okay. are political intellectuals mm. who are seasoned technocrats they can govern mm -hmm. but they can also think which means that they understand the crisis mm -hmm. They know what the limitations are, okay. and they know what they can do within those limitations. Right. That, I would argue, is absent in the collective mind of African leaders. Okay. Now, why do I say that? It doesn't mean that in every decade, mm. 
Mm. There haven't been leaders who fit that bill. They've been. Yeah. So you have Amilcar Cabral, for instance, of Guinea-Bissau. Yeah. He was killed very early. You have San Thomas Sankara. Sankara. Recently, you had Magufuli. You had people like Nkrumah. Mm. Nkrumah made this argument in the 1960s. Right. That there's a dif difference between political na uh, nationalism mm. and political sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And that there's a difference between economic nationalism and mm. economic sovereignty. Exactly. Political nationalism being registering your frustration with the colonial order okay. and registering the fact that you want to govern yourself. Mm. Political sovereignty is the actual process mm -hmm. of creating the institutions that mm. allow you mm -hmm. not only to govern yourself, okay. but to unfeather yourself mm. from the previous existing social systems right. that essentially. But right. what Professor Fleming points to, mm. to me it seems to be that the basic hardware uh -huh. of African leaders right. remains African, but the software Mm. is still very European and Western. Mm. Very, very punchy uh, words right there uh, by uh, Professor Eden. Of course, that's at, from uh, Dr. Uh, Manko Tam's submission. I like it. The basic is about African, but the software is, is Western. Super. And, and of course, uh, this is uh, the conversation that we're having, our first conversation, moral and eth ethical decay. However, my colleague, Hafiz Guru, uh, who's also the producer to the Africa Daily Show, uh, I believe you've, you've, you've consumed yeah. tons, I mean, uh, knowledge right here from Prof and Doc. But from all they've, they've said so far, what is your takeaway? Yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, Prof and Doc have actually, uh, you know, hit on certain salient points. Right. And They've actually had me, you know, looking at conversations differently, mm -hmm. you know, asking certain questions. I mean, because you see it every day and some way, somehow, you never really question some of these things right. that go on. But for me, when he made his submissions, mm -hmm. uh, I think some questions came up in my right. head and I don't know if I can put it across mm -hmm. to Prof. Now, Prof, uh, some way, somehow, when you talk about leadership, I mean, in Africa, Africa is dubbed as the youngest continent. Mm. Ironically, uh, when you look at the continent, it has some of the longest and oldest seven leaders. Yes. You talk about Paul Bia of Cameroon, mm. who is 88. Yeah. yeah. Talk about Muhammad Buhari of Nigeria, 77. Right. Our own Akufado, 77. Yeah. Museveni, 78. Yeah. I mean, is it... How do you explain that situation? Do you think the fact that they are not in tune with the general populace. It's 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 a reason to 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 you know to attribute to some of the decisions that take. You feel they are not in tune with, you know, you know the general sentiment and uh, you know the quiet that goes on in the in the various countries that they govern. <laughs> Look, it's it's a powerful question, and I speak directly. So when I say that, it's out of respect to what you said. It's a very powerful question. But here's the problem. Here's the uh, dynamic that you raise. You raise the dynamic of uh, long-serving African leaders, right? Both in time and in age, mm. right? So they're not only old. That's not new. I mean, we had Mobutu, we had Ofe Bonye in Yedima in uh, Togo. Quite recently, Kampari himself was there for 27 years. So you could go on and on and on and on and on. My view and response to that question, yes, there is a disconnect. There is some sort of a practical and emotional disconnect between age and how they govern, right? That, that I mean, sorry, connection between their age and, 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 and how they govern. Uh, but there are other factors to it which is that, and I think we'll get to it, our institutions are in fact transitional institutions. They've always been transitional institutions. We choose to think of them as permanent institutions, but they are not. And the best case study that we have to test my hypothesis will be what happens to Rwanda when Kagame goes. Because that's when we'll find out if it is the person, the charisma of Kagame, or the institutions that have been holding the country together. I love, I love that. Uh, uh, yeah. Doc, is there anything you want to top up to that? Or to his question, talking about <laughs> how longing we have, I mean, older leaders serving for longer periods. And actually, some are actually looking to, you know, extend their, their, their rule, which <laughs> most of us would find so, I mean, not welcoming, actually. 
Well, I, I, it reminds me of a text that I'm uh, currently reading called The New Apartheid. And one of the arguments that the author makes is that the transitional nature of the African state has been from its inception. And the conservatism, um, the conservatism of our um, voting patterns, I would say, or um, the, the conservative nature of our, of our endorsement of governance, I think has a lot to do with um, the current impasse of a continent that is over 70% uh, youth with uh, a leadership that doesn't reflect that reality. Yes. But I think the corruption, mm. why they rule longer, they play the major role. Is that Not just their corruption, but mm. the corruption of the masses themselves. Right, right, All right. What, I, yeah, I, and I, 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 like the, I like that particular one. Mm. Yeah, and what I mean by that is, of course, uh, just quickly, mm. if you have, uh, yeah, just there, there, one uh, a French uh, philosopher called Montesquieu. Okay. Yeah. I don't like, you see, I don't cite a lot of intellectuals. I'm very disgruntled with intellectual work. I think they've actually made it difficult for change to happen. Mm. Mm -hmm. But Montesquieu said that um, um, in an age mm -hmm. of ignorance, okay. governments have no doubt while they commit the greatest of evils. Mm. But in an enlightened, in an enlightened society, okay. governments tremble, even while they are doing the greatest of good things, mm. because such governments are enlightening themselves mm. to see the abuses of the corrections themselves. Right. That you are not just doing good things, mm. but you see what is wrong about the good things that, that you are doing, doing, because you are afraid exactly. of what the critique. Exactly. Might bring so it it's, it's a dialectical situation, mm. you know. But the corruption of the masses mm. is what I call a necessary sort of existential choice that they are making. Okay. They say when the fish gets rotten, mm. it starts getting rotten from the head. Right. And then the body follows. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yidana and Dr. Mankutam, for your uh, in, an insightful contribution on our very first topic, moral and ethical decay, as well as uh, Hafiz for your question as well. Very, I mean, intriguing. So, I mean, this would definitely bring us to the end of our first series, and uh, we would definitely be going to our next um, series pretty soon. But like I said, this particular video would be made available on our YouTube page, Africa Global Radio, pretty soon so you can get to understand and possibly ask questions. I mean, whatever question through your comments that you have, we will definitely convey these to Prof and Doc so we can get more answers for you out there. So thank you. And yeah, next video would be made available on YouTube. I am Barry Musa. And uh, interesting uh, startup on the surviving Africa in the 21st century, echoes and lessons from the 20th century, a literature yet to be launched by Professor Yidana. Thank you. Mm -hmm.